You're listening to Daughter Father Dance Podcast. Hi, Daddy. Hi, Boo. That's not proof to me they exist. That's just proof that you believe they exist. Prayer, first of all, it's easy. Secondly, it's effective. The God you love so much made me this way. Hey, hey, listen. That's well, my believe point. Is what I'm, you believe. I know, but okay, so what I'm saying is. Amen. Oh, gosh. <laughs> hey, everybody. Today's episode is a difficult one. It's one that makes my stomach hurt just thinking about it. And I have my suspicions as to why, one of which is how much I know this issue truly hurts my dad, to his core. I've had more talks than this one about this subject with dad, and every time, I walk away feeling a great deal of sympathy for his views. This is a subject that is hyper-divisive, and for reason. But I hope that today listeners come away with a better understanding of persons on the other side of this issue than themselves. Today, be it me or dad, depending on where you fall within your own perspective. Well, that's my hope in any of these conversations, is that we try for once to see through the lens from which the other person is seeing. We may peer through and say, ooh, yuck, I don't want to look at this, it's ugly, or it's too hard, or it brings something up in me that's uncomfortable, or conjures feelings I don't quite understand. But what if the only way we are going to manifest unity on any of these tougher-than-hell issues is to talk and to listen to the other side of the story. This is never more apparent than in these types of conversations with Dad. And thank God I have a father that allows me to speak my mind and feels enough conviction to speak his. I wonder, too, if my -my sick-to-my-stomach feeling might be because my own stance on this topic draws scrutiny about, at the end of the day, where I fully stand. And how do we resolve this? You'll hear more about all of this soon. But I do want to say that if you are triggered by the subject of abortion, you might want to sit this one out. We don't get graphic or say anything terribly horrible, but we do talk frankly about it. So if that could potentially upset you, we encourage you to sit this one out and we hope to see you back here next week. And lastly, before we turn to mine and dad's conversation, I hope everyone who listens knows that my intention for these conversations is to help heal an open dialogue that allows healing in a world divided and hurting. Divided and hurting on this subject and so many others. Okay, here we go. My position on this very controversial subject is one that I best described several years ago when I was in Seattle to a woman who essentially called me out for a comment I made about my stance on pro-life answering a question, yes, I am pro-life personally because I do believe that a human life begins at conception. However, I am pro-choice societally because I do not, my friend, some of my friends and people in the world do not have the same belief that human life begins at conception. And that really bothered her. Okay. Where's my responsibility in this? And what can I see from what she's saying back to me? And what it did, it didn't change my mind. It really actually solidified my stance because I think it's like anything, right? Is there a universal truth or is truth personal to an individual? And I think there are certain truths that are personal to an individual. My truth in this scenario is I am pro-life personally because I believe that a human life is formed at conception. But I don't think people can mandate laws and deny the ability to be pro-choice in terms of the abortion argument because some people do not believe the same thing I do. So it feels like a really slippery slope to mandate laws that only support one side of a belief. Well, think about this. Prior to the 70s and the late 60s, that was not something that was the normal everyday language. Now, given that you were a child, or even before you were born, there was no pro-life, pro-choice agenda or talking points. This is something that evolved on a bigger scale or more often scale when this abortion issue became something that was advanced by media 
But for everyday language or everyday conversation, the pro-life, pro-choice thing evolved because of politics. That was nothing we talked about, being pro-life. That was, was like, where in the hell did that come from? Back in the late 60s, early 70s, this thing about pro-life or abortion. Well, right, but it came about because of Roe v. Wade. I mean, Roe v. Wade is what put the pro-life, pro-choice narrative on the, the landscape of society. Can I go back to what you were asked saying or what you asserted about it being a political move? Because where, what are you citing on that? What agenda are you citing that it was political? Well, I'm trying to think chronologically of uh, how I could develop that or explain it better. Uh, I said political because I think the seeds that were scattered during this whole debate on the Supreme Court taking this case about a woman's privacy, this was talked about prior to it going to the Supreme Court. It was exposed during the Supreme Court's decision my understanding is that it, a sh spotlight was shown on it, one, because it became a, a very pivotal Supreme Court case. Yeah, but my, but my, could my it, idea is why did it have to go to the Supreme Court? Why wasn't, this, why wasn't this decided by the medical professions that, whose instructions in medical books talk about life begins at conception? That all of a sudden became... Why do we believe that? Why, why, who? Well, but who? I don't know if that's in medical books. How does? Yeah. There, can you cite a medical book? Yeah, doctors are instructed that life begins at conception because they talk about the the reproductive process of the sperm and the egg and the fertilization of it and how it becomes implanted and how it grows. All that is in the medical books. For people who want to get in the medical field, that's just that's just one piece of a lot of different things that they study while okay, they're in I school. See I see what you're saying. You're saying, why couldn't we leave it to the not subjected to the Supreme Court and it be politicized, but leave it in the medical hands? What is your is your argument that at one point we all believed that conception or excuse me, human life started when the sperm hit the egg? Correct. Okay, I'm not sure that assertion's true, but I'm in, let's just go with that, okay? Because I don't, I'm not looking anything up right now. I'm looking at you, and I don't want to get on the internet and clickety clack. But for the sake of this argument, and we can do some research in post about it, but for the sake of this argument, let's say at one point it was universally accepted that at conception that was human life. Because see, the arguments now, or you know, ha that I've been privy to and spoken with people that have actually had abortions. There is this gray area of what are they destroying? Are they destroying a sack of cells or are they destroying a human life? And that's what I want to talk about today because, again, and I don't know what it's from. Somebody said, well, what's that from? Is it from science or is it from your upbringing? I don't care what it's from. It's from what I believe, right? Just like I believe there's a God. But what I want to get into is this whole piece of mandating that they can't happen because other people don't believe the way that I believe. Okay. Ugh, I can hear the exhaustion in dad's voice. He's been fighting for the unborn for as long as I can remember. And it's been a rough fight for him because again, he believes that innocent lives are being destroyed. And whether you or I believe otherwise, he's not giving up the fight, but it's an exhausting one. I just think there's another way to move the needle on bridging the divide than criminalizing a woman's choice to do what she feels is right for her life and her body. Because I don't believe there are very many women whom, if they thought for a second they were murdering a child, would entertain abortion. This is the stance I'm trying to take with my father. Going back to, let's say, the founding fathers of our country that we are citizens in, there is a phrase that all men are created equal, endowed with the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, that was back in the 1700s when that became a constitution. Prior to that, it was already thought of and taken for granted in religion. 
the scriptures, and you've got to remember when scripture was given to us in a book form. The Catholic Church formed manuscripts into a book form in the Council of Hippo in the year 385, or I should say the years 385 to 405. It took years to accumulate all the handwritten known manuscripts from the apostolic age, which is the first, second, third, fourth centuries, and brought together. Well, scripture even says when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and explained to her that she was going to conceive a child in her womb, that was taken for granted. That was known throughout all Christianity, that God became man through Mary, and he became man by the conception of the Holy Spirit in her womb. Well, with that in mind, this idea that life begins not at conception, or it only begins when a fetus is brought through the birth canal and takes a breath, then that fetus becomes a human being. All of that has been suggested and talked about of when human life begins. When prior to all this, in the 60s and 70s, life began at conception, period. Nobody challenged that. Nobody questioned that. Even doctors not violating the Hippocratic Oath. Is the, is it in the Hippocratic Oath, and I'm asking because I don't know, is it in the Hippocratic Oath that life begins at conception, that a human is formed at conception? I don't know where it says it, if it's in the Hippocratic Oath, but I bring that Hippocratic Oath up because the doctor takes an oath right. to defend life, period. Now, okay, when does gotcha. life begin? Right. They knew. They knew it began at conception. So they took an oath believing that. That's the point I'm making. It's a good point. It is. So all this so crap, give- all this stuff about when does the fetus become a human? When is it not a, a bunch of cells thrown together? Well, good grief, Uh, how in the world are any of us brought into this world? We're conceived in our mother's womb by the fact that our father's sperm fertilized our mother's egg and new life began. That fertilization of that sperm and egg and life begins at conception. That's when God assigns us our own angel. Life begins then. So really, when we're born, we're nine months old then. Exactly. And you know, there's a, there's a, (laughs) they better get our birthday straight because that's, well, let me tell you this story. Now, I'm not sure how accurate I am on it, but there's a ethnic group that believes that counting from when that child was conceived as the beginning, they don't call when the child is delivered. They don't call that the birthday. They just call that's the day they entered the world or something like that. But Well, that would sure help the argument a little bit if we could get that straight. I mean, seriously. The other piece of this pro-choice, pro-life narrative is the argument or it's, you know, it's it's more than an argument. It's a, a war zone. There's that whole argument about it being our bodies, our choice, right? And there's validity to that, Dad, because this is one of those really tricky conversations to have with a white male that doesn't have to, you don't have the ramifications of this issue ever. You'll never have to deal with it. You only get to make laws about it or talk about it from a framework of faith or find justification in a way that you don't ever have to deal with the process that the woman has to go through, even if you were the one who impregnated her. Well, what did you mean by white male? Well, because that's usually who's making the decisions about the, the laws. Why did you have to say a white male? Isn't that racist? Because that that's because that's what you are. You're a white male. Using you as an example of you're not you like other men. They're not subject to any of the ramifications of this issue. Now, to be fair, my dad has a point. I didn't have to call out the fact that he is a white male, and my stating that that's just what he is was a lame attempt to cover up why I really said it. It was a jab, because I do feel that white males have an inordinate amount of privilege and are rarely affected by the laws they all seem to like to make around female empowerment of any kind, not just around abortion, but anything having to do with the feminine. They're not subject to any of the ramifications of this issue. 
They just yes. get to make the laws about it. And how are they? The, they are subject to any ramifications of going through the God-given design of procreation. Dad goes on here to proselytize morality, and I go on to say some pretty ugly things about men just squirting their seed and walking away and leaving women to deal with their literal fallout. It was ugly, and it's not something I really want you to hear. But we found our footing again. Mankind has screwed up, has done something different. They've gotten away from the original plan. I'm saying that anybody that fathers a child is responsible for that child, period, by God's design. Now, if it wasn't followed the way God designed it, that's on us. That's not on God. Dad's assertion is that we are facing all these issues because most of the world is a bunch of sinful fornicators. Well, that's his perspective. To lighten things up a bit, I am going to read an excerpt from a blog post that I wrote about this next portion. It's a little lighter, and we could use a break from this hard conversation. And I think it'll offer a different perspective on my dad relative to this subject. When my sister Julie and I were young, we accompanied our parents to pro-life rallies. I use accompanied lightly as we were never really given a choice, pun intended, as to whether we attended or stayed home. I would have done just about anything to be able to boycott these rallies. I even entertained telling mom I would become a nun if she would just let me stay home. But I had a goal to be the first female priest, and becoming a nun would totally foil that plan. Instead, Julie and I, under duress, piled into the station wagon with our little arms donning uncomfortable and poorly made metal anti-Roe v. Wade bracelets. Thankfully, there was enough room in the middle seat so that we didn't have to share real estate with the Save the Embryo posters stacked dozens high in the far back seat of our vehicle. I was always confused at how people with empathy for unborn persons found it okay and even somewhat imperative to be so incredibly cruel to the living persons. Pro-lifers in those days tended to shout obscenities into the faces of people whose opinions, both scientific and religious, differed from theirs. It was as confusing to me as overhearing mom and dad argue about religion. It confounded my sister and me, and witnessing the seething debates between pro-lifers and pro-choicers fostered the same strange feeling that would well up inside me at hearing a heated conversation between my parents about their varied views on church matters. My dad, as we all know, is impassioned about many things. Saving the lives of souls transported within an unborn embryo or fetus is absolutely no exception. My most memorable story to convey dad's passion and belief about the sanctity of the unborn took place Christmas of 2010 when Mr. and Mrs. Gladback greeted us in the back of church after Christmas Eve Mass at our family parish. We share greetings full of typical holiday cheer as the Gladbacks eyeball the 16 members of my immediate family, and we somehow all avoid answering the awkward inquiry as to why Jean Arthur's oldest daughter has never settled down and married, a question most folks, including Jim Gladback in this moment, asks in the third person as if I'm not standing only feet away from them. Seeing that the question is met with under-our-breath utterances of things such as laws having to change or... Janae hasn't yet met the right woman or person, Mr. Gladback proceeds to ask a question that is more benign and less awkward for everyone. Or so we think. Gene, how many grandchildren do you have now? Dad beams with pride as he puts his arm around his oldest grandson, Nicholas. I have nine beautiful grandchildren, Jim. Joyce and I are very blessed. There is a moment of general confusion amongst me and my siblings as we look at one another with that WTF gaze and then finally shake our heads and roll our eyes. It's apparent that we are all resigned to the fact that spelling is not dad's only weakness, but that math may also be one of his less fortified skills. We all turn and give Jim and Sandy Gladback polite smiles and partial head nods as we look sideways at each other, and I begin a head count of my nieces and nephews. After we hug these two people whom we likely will never see again until next year's Christmas Mass, the four of us kids whirl about and humorously berate my father for miscounting the grandchildren with whom he and Mom have been blessed. We all laugh that sarcastic, at someone else's expense, Arthur laugh, and I grab Dad's arm and say something about him being a piece of work. 
As we all turn to leave the church for our convoy to our traditional meat pie madness, Dad stops abruptly, turns to us, and says with certainty, I do have nine grandchildren. He proceeds to the church exit. My siblings and I immediately reply in unison, accompanied by his eight, not nine, grandchildren. Um, no you don't. You have eight grandchildren, Dad. At which point someone begins to name them out loud. Dad stops again, turns to us, and says matter-of-factly, I have nine grandchildren. What about Finn? We're all expecting some sort of punchline, and when it isn't delivered, my brother says, Who the F is Finn? My precious grandson, who was miscarried, Dad responds. I'm not sure if someone actually punched me in the throat or if I somehow instantly grew an Adam's apple. A knot, huge as could be, wells up in my esophagus and I freeze, unable to speak and not quite sure I want to say anything. I try to anticipate what on earth could possibly happen after I am able to get my body to finally exhale. I look over at my sister and wonder, how are her eyelids moving so fast? I peer at my brothers and their wives. They both resemble the mannequins used to stage those 1970s nuclear bomb preparedness videos. You know, the frozen, smiling fiberglass models standing lifeless in a serene domestic setting before the simulated bomb obliterates them into dust. My brother Jared is the one who musters the courage to say anything, while I'm frankly just fine with having been momentarily struck deaf and dumb. Geez, Dad, really? What the hell? I suddenly realize this ninth grandbaby Dad refers to belonged to my dear brother Jared. If he and my sister-in-law had had another boy, they would have named the baby Finnegan, or Finbar, and called him Finn. This adds to the poignancy of the moment. Jared turns and walks away. I can't breathe, mostly because I can't imagine how my little brother is feeling, and because I know Dad is serious. He believes this, that he has nine grandchildren, and though something about this is astonishing and unsettling to all of us, there is something that is equally fascinating about it, touching us all in an indescribable way. His unwavering faith and belief that a human soul perished in utero before becoming a member of his family, the family that is the pride and joy and the very reason for his existence, causes tears to well in Dad's eyes as he takes a moment to reflect. Without defensiveness or justification, my father inhales, turns from us, takes my mother's hand, begins to walk to the church exit, and says over his shoulder, I pray for Finn every day, and I can't wait to meet him in heaven. That damn knot expands in my throat, and now it feels as though someone has kicked me in the stomach. I swallow hard, look into this church sanctuary at the Blessed Sacrament, and recall the conversation I had with Dad when I was a little girl. He encouraged me to always be the one believer in a room full of non-believers. He imparted this wisdom not only regarding faith, but in terms of remaining steadfast in my own individual beliefs, while standing up for what is true and right and just, especially when the weak and innocent are unable to do it for themselves. I close my eyes and finally exhale, hoping that my brother is okay, and that my dad will someday soon stop carrying the weight of Jesus' cross on his back. As if in autopilot, I send a prayerful nod to Finn, to please remind his grandfather that everything happens for a reason. As we walk in solemnity and awkward confusion to our cars, I'm reminded of a poem I wrote to Mom on Mother's Day years ago, a couple of stanzas acknowledging the joy I must have felt when I chose to be born to her. My choice, I thought again. Of course, I don't really remember this pre-earthen moment of selection, but what if I, and all of us, had a choice to come into the world the way we want and to whom we want? I mean, if the very source from which we all come is all-encompassing, with no beginning and no end, aren't we? And what if we all have a choice before we enter the biological material known as human bodies? It would certainly put an end to both sides of the debate about who, when, what, and where a human begins and ends. If we are all truly souls, then as the Tibetan monks remind us, we never die, and we've always been. It obliterates the strong stance everyone on either side of this and any other aisle of polarity we can conjure. But what if it's true? If I had a choice about to whom I was born, maybe Finn decided at the last minute that he wanted to be somewhere else, or that my brother and sister's lives would be more rich and full for experiencing the momentary loss of him, or that his grandfather would one day make a statement on Christmas Eve that would rock the world of his four children and give his eight living grandchildren something to ponder. I have no clue. We don't know anything. We can only have faith that something is true or not true, 
and that faith is often directly related to what we want to believe. I realize as I pass the doors of the church sanctuary that I don't know anything. I don't know anything except that I have a father whom I dearly love and whose unapologetic faith means that he remains committed to fighting for unborn persons. Though my life entails a path and a belief that differs from his, since I feel everyone should be able to make their choice, their own choice about what is real and true for them, something my daddy actually taught me, I'm finally at peace with our difference about this issue. I understand my dad more in this moment, and as I look back with a cat's in the cradle perspective on our seething arguments about religion and the beliefs that surround it, I can finally breathe again. I walk to catch up with mom and dad, take my dad's other hand and say to him, I love you, dad. Merry Christmas. Dad smiles and clasps my hand tighter. Mom keeps walking forward without looking at either of us. I know this is because she is about to cry. Hey guys, remember that time you blamed Terry for stopping up the toilet by flushing a tampon? Well, I was actually the one who stopped it up. They both look at me in confusion as I was only 10 years old and both of them knew I wasn't yet menstruating. Not with a tampon. I purposely flushed my pro-life bracelet down the toilet. I kind of hated it and it turned my wrist green, I say with the innocence of a 10-year-old. Dad looks down at me, pulls me and my mom closer to him and keeps walking. He could give a rat's ass about a toilet clog from 30 years ago, or that damn metal bracelet for that matter. We have meat pies to consume and it's Christmas season, a time of year when we are reminded about the important things in life. This particular Christmas, I am reminded that differing beliefs don't matter as long as everyone is kind and loving and open-minded about it all. Later that night, it dawns on me that the 60-plus headcount of my closest relatives in this room could likely be skewed to over 70 if we, like my father, acknowledged all the fins of our family. This overwhelms my mind for a moment. As one of my cousin's kids shrieks, I take a deep breath and ponder the idea that maybe Finn decided crowds weren't really his thing. What? No, I'm just uh, thinking about what you're telling me to talk about. You want me to, Why are you laughing? You want me to talk about it now? Yeah. Okay. She lost that child. That child had already been given a guardian angel and had already began life. So I remember that child, and I named that child Finbar because mm-hmm. I knew his nickname would be Finny. Well, that's why I say what I do about Finbar. That innocent child, that innocent life that was formed didn't make it to birthing age. We lost Mm -hmm. the child. That child was innocent. It's definitely a beautiful testament of your belief that life begins at conception. There were arguments to saying, well, when does a human being become a human being? And as you know, there were debates on at what stage in the pregnancy is this fetus considered a human being and endowed with rights of the Constitution. It divided people, it drew criticism from every walk of life. It was like a nightmare being lived out in everyday life. All that stuff, Janae, hit me personally and your mom as a uh, an awake nightmare. How th- could this happen? Wh- what are we, savages? Are we godless people? We don't understand how life begins. All those questions where I know were going through my mind as a young man in my 20s, wondering what the hell's going on. And those were questions that we're still fighting today. You may think that abortion should be a personal choice. Uh, it, it is a personal choice. And I believe it's just the wrong choice. But dad, every, but everything that's wrong that we choose personally is whatever choice. We know right from wrong. And when we violate that against what our knowing, we pay a price for that. No matter what, whether you believe in God or not, there is cause and effect. So my point of not making laws, especially criminalizing things that are sometimes out of the person's control, my point is when whoever's making the choices, when, you know, as you call it, sin, when we make a choice to sin, we pay a price. There's a consequence. My issue is that there's a political 
mandate being made around this choice, a political mandate around something that is not irrefutable, that it is a human being. I believe it is, you believe it is, but not everyone does. So until that's irrefutable and you can say you are murdering a human being, I don't think we can mandate that kind of a law because it basically means the court can mandate whatever else they want. So I'm just arguing the fact that I'm pro-choice in societal because I'm pro-choice for anything. People have to make their own choices. That's between them and God, always. Now, if it's you murder, you can't gun somebody down in the street because you are murdering a human being that we all believe and know has taken breath is a life. I can't argue with people that have their issues around, I didn't abort a person, I aborted tissue. And that's why I am pro-life personally and I am pro-choice societally because I am absolutely against a group of judges saying that a choice I'm making, I can't make. Well, a group of judges made it possible for you to even make that statement by legalizing abortion. But dad, they are legalizing a process that was in happening anyway, in alleys and behind closed doors and women were dying. People were not just babies were being killed, Pe women that were pregnant with these babies. They gave med the medical community the ability to live out that person's choice rather than them have to go hide and do it. That's, that's the way that I'm seeing it. And I get what you're seeing, how you're seeing it. Personally, I agree, but I can't put that on somebody else. Well, the author of life, God himself, in the commandments said, thou shalt not kill. Abortion is murder, plain and simple. Yeah, well, Pooh, you said that you personally are against abortion, but you sound to me like a politician. I do? Yeah. Oh, personally, I'm against abortion, but... Well, wait, wait, wait. I didn't say I, I said personally, I believe life begins at conception. Okay. I heard you say that. Okay. I believe that too. Okay. But societally, I don't have the right to put my belief on someone else is my point of being pro-choice. I'm a pro-choice in that I don't think the law should mandate whether someone believes that that is a child at conception or that that is a sack of tissue for however many weeks it is. That's what I'm asserting and that's what I believe. So dad, how do you think um, we resolve? Like one of the intents behind this podcast is that you and I have different beliefs, but, or we see things from a different perspective, but we don't allow it to keep us divided. How are we going to bridge the divide on this? And I think we have to talk more about it. We're too busy pointing fingers at each other and saying, you're pro-lifer and you're a pro-choice or you're a Democrat or you're a Republic or you're an anti-vaxxer or you're a vaxxer. And it's like, we're all humans struggling with the same issues wrapped in different packages. So let's talk about it. But what do you think it's going to take for us to resolve this? Because if you think about it, it's it, okay. Think about it this way. Like I know a lot of people, I was once one who don't eat animals because they, they don't want to kill them or they don't eat animals because they think it's a burden on planet earth. I have friends that think that's ludicrous. They eat animals. They even will cite like you do biblical justification of it that man has dominion over all so we can shoot that thing and eat it okay we all can look at that from so many different ways but the truth is my belief when i was a vegan that not eating meat was my choice i could not assert that and put that on someone else because it, they don't see it that way they see it for all the things i just told you about that's what I'm saying about my stance on this whole pro-life, pro-choice narrative. Because as you said, it was, once wasn't a narrative. It once was, I don't know what it was because I didn't live back then. It was, wasn't a big issue. And do I think things are politicized? Hell yeah. I think more things than need to be are politicized. And that's why we are halfway, half the reason or however, whatever percentage we are in these problems. But at the end of the day, if you don't believe four weeks into your pregnancy, eight weeks into your pregnancy, that's actually a baby. I don't know how to get to get over that hurdle, dad, because you're not going to convince somebody just by throwing Catholic doctrine or dogma or Bible verses or you're that's not the convincing narrative. My question to you is what could be? And certainly it's not going to pro-life and pro-life rallies and yelling at people across the aisle with signs of dismembered baby parts. It, those things don't work. So what is it going to take for this to be no, no longer a divisive narrative? 
I, I just pray daily for an end to legalized abortion. Mm -hmm. That's just one of my prayers. I pray daily. There's a lot of prayers I pray daily, but because we're talking about this subject, the basic foundation for any solution is prayer. And though I agree with Dad on this, that prayer is the foundation of any solution, I want to offer another note to end on. I want you to think about something. What if the truth that could put all this to rest was in fact hidden in the lines of that poem I wrote to Mom? Not because I have the answers or know the design of the universe, or even that I know for certain that I chose to come to the world by way of Mom and Dad and my family. But isn't it just as plausible as any other assertion anyone can make on this issue? What if the choices we make, we somehow contracted with everyone involved before we made them? Just think about that for a moment. Thanks again for hanging in there with us. I'm beyond grateful that you're here. See you next time.